Hello and after this uh, slight summer break, welcome back on this new edition of Primetime Watchmaking in the News. And I'm actually quite glad uh, we didn't do one last month. Uh, it would have been a rather short one. But good news now is that we indeed do have plenty of stuff to talk about. A few noteworthy product launches, Omega, MBNF with Lepe, Armstrong, Singer, Singer Reimagined, Bachelor Constantin, Panerai, Gégère Le Coult, Oris and more actually. So we also have some business news, impact of what's currently going on in Hong Kong, distribution shortage and outrage for some, GPHG nominees only watch, and obviously uh, what to expect in the coming weeks and a nice surprise thanks to all of you. So let's go and we'll start with a very different unboxing sequence. Yes, today is a very special unboxing sequence, a beautiful birthday, probably my best birthday present ever because I received something quite special the other day. So let's open this nice little present to start off with. Yes, here we make it. This is something pretty sweet coming from our good friends over there, but I have not yet opened it. I had uh, just wanted to wait with you guys to discover this together. Let's go. Am I there? Not really. Excitement and climate gets to its peak. If I manage it, of course. All right, a box, a letter. Well, I'll read this a little bit later, but now let's discover immediately what we're talking about. And here we go. So there we are, our silver play button presented to the Watchers TV. And that's all thanks to you. I feel extremely immensely proud for me and for my little team, of course. This means a lot to us, but it's just the start of uh, another thing. Thank you so much. Let's go back to prime time. So uh, with this good news uh, came actually a sadder one as our beloved uh, Watchmobile number one passed away. I was in the Valley de Joux for some meetings and an unattentive person simply bumped into the back of our car and repairs were just too costly considering uh, the age and kilometers of uh, this car. So yes, even cows showed us uh, some empathy. And I had this mission of taking Watchmobile up to 300,000 kilometers. We were up to 265. Not bad, so gently getting there, but we just have to move on and Watchmobile number two will arrive soon and sticking to the Beamer though. Okay, let's now talk watches and we'll start with Omega, which introduced a few uh, timepieces in the last uh, weeks. And obviously on the very date of the 50th anniversary of the moon landing on July uh, the 20th, Omega had to announce something uh, special and they did, with, uh, did so with a platinum version of the Speedmaster but featuring the re-edition of the 321 caliber, the actual movement which made it to the moon, meaning uh, no coaxial escapement like all modern Omega watches, but a truly beautiful movement, uh, kind of a legend actually. So this timepiece uh, won't be limited, it comes with a black onyx dial, meteorite uh, sub-dials, 42mm in width, but Omega did mention that it will not produce more than 2,000 of such movements uh, per year, which will probably uh, be fitted in other watches too. Okay, price tag is, as you can imagine, quite high, approximately 60,000 US dollars. And you have to be quite an Omega fan to purchase this. But Omega didn't stop there in terms of highly priced uh, timepieces, as they just introduced a super light Seamaster Aquaterra weighing a mere 55 grams. And just a few days ago was held here in Geneva, the Omega European Master in uh, Comontana, to be precise. And one of their most uh, illustrious ambassadors, uh, Irish golfer Rory McIlroy, played with this watch on his wrist, making it uh, to the playoff on the fourth day of the competition, but ultimately didn't win. Anyhow, this watch wants to demonstrate Omega's ability when it comes to research and development. And uh, they managed this uh, pretty well using, for instance, a new titanium alloy called Gamma Titanium uh, for the case, uh, case back and crown, which is supposedly uh, lighter and stronger and more scratch resistant than normal titanium, which was uh, used, for instance, uh, for the dial. So one cool feature is the crown that you can 
push uh, almost inside the case and by pressing on it it will pop out uh, and be used as normal for uh, time setting but also for winding uh, since this is a manual wound watch with 72 hours of power reserve. So to keep weight as low as possible Omega also used uh, titanium for some uh, movement components, bridges and base plate in particular giving it this uh, pretty nice grey colour. But for me the little uh, glitch is its price. I understand that 55 gram is a remarkable achievement for a watch that really looks like a watch. Uh, and uh, what I mean by that is that uh, they didn't for instance uh, go down the route of extreme skeletonization. I hate this word but nevertheless you got my point. But uh, almost 50,000 US dollar for a three-hander is quite a statement. And I really guess that uh, Omega wants to up their game in terms of overall brand value perception. And this is just a way of achieving it. And to finish off on this watch, well, it's not limited and will be part of the collection and come with uh, three colors, blue, green and, uh, uh, and red. There we are. And uh, will be available on the market later this year in December. So I doubt they will sell it in the thousands, uh, neither in the hundreds, but just uh, some kind of marketing power statement. But if you really want to, uh, if you really want an Aquaterra Seamaster at a more reasonable price, well, Omega also introduced a Tokyo 2020 edition coming with this pretty graphical blue dial. Uh, but now, now let's move on from Amiga. Okay, next timepiece with a much niche brand as Armistrom introduced a rather complex timepiece uh, marking the 10th anniversary of their integrated manufacture. And listen to this. They released a beefed up version of their resonance movement coming with a minute repeater mechanism. So it's the very first time that we see a resonance movement combined with any type of complication. And to achieve this, uh, well, they partnered with the Cirque des Horlogers, a company with a strong expertise in uh, chiming movement uh, developments. So this will be a limited series of 10, comes in a titanium case and we had the chance of not only seeing it but uh, of course hearing it here at uh, the Watches Club and sound quality is really all the way up there. I really like the architecture of this movement uh, made up of 400 components. It's a real show for your eyes as you can observe and enjoy really well the intricacy of the movement and these really nice uh, floating uh, gongs surrounding the dial. So Armstrong is a small yet impressive outfit and if you want to know more about them well I clearly invite you to check the walkthrough video we had done about them a little while back. It's very inspiring and yes we like to produce these, these uh, in-depth manufacturer visits uh, such as the recent one regarding the Betune and we'll have more of these coming your way soon. So next one will be about our good friend Kari Vutilainen. Can't wait uh, to go and film this actually tomorrow. Okay, next, and MBNF pursued uh, their collaboration with Lippe 1839 with another fantastic table clock called T-Rex. And it's pretty easy to see where that name came from. So this clock holds uh, eight days of power reserve and three versions are available, blue, red and green, limited to 100 pieces each. The domed uh, colored glass comes from the workshop of a famous Italian or should I say Venetian company Murano and additional to these uh, three versions, uh, one of version uh, featuring a small sculpture of a child riding the beast has been produced for the Only Watch charity auction to be held later uh, this year in Geneva on November the 9th. And talking about Only Watch, well, all of the kind of 50 unique pieces will soon be displayed during the Monaco Yacht Show. Uh, during, that's during the last week of September. And we should be there to share with you a special report on these very special timepieces. Next product launch uh, concerns uh, Singer uh, Reimagine and after the original release uh, some two years ago of the Track 1 using this very innovative chronograph movement developed by Agenor, a movement whose uh, particularity is to have all chrono indication uh, hands centered on the same axis. Well, Singer has produced limited edition of 50 pieces of this watch uh, featuring small variations. These uh, limited editions always refer to a city and after Geneva and Hong Kong, now comes the London edition. And I have to say that I quite like it. I mean, there's obviously a 70s feel to it, like the cars produced uh, by the Californian parent company. And this titanium case to watch features a nice blue dial. And like uh, all of them, well, time indication is found using two peripheral uh, rotating discs and you actually read the time at six o'clock. Again, if you want to know more about this amazing movement, well, you can check the special and in-depth report we produced at the time. Really fascinating stuff. And we like Mr. Vidoresh. 
So, next, German brand R. Lange & Sonne continues to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Lange 1, one of my favorite watch of all time, I have to admit, and coming each month with a new limited edition of 25 pieces. And for this month, well, they introduced a special moon face version in a gray gold case, silver dial, blue hands, and the moon indication is hand engraved on a gray gold disc. So just nice, simple as that. And by the way, last month uh, was introduced a special big date version alongside the same design characteristics that, that I just mentioned. Anyhow, the Lange One Festival continues and we should see more by year's end. Okay, next. And in 2015, Vacheron Constantin reintroduced a timepiece which sparked immediate enthusiasm from collectors uh, with the historic Corn de Vache, 1955. But it came either in a platinum or pink gold uh, case, therefore rather costly. Well, now uh, Vacheron introduced a steel version of this watch, a pretty smart move from them. And this 38.5mm uh, watch just looks good. And instead of using alligator straps, well, this new model comes with a brown carved leather bracelet. So the movement based on the original Le Mania 2310 looks really good too. I mean, I like it, just have this classical uh, uh, feel to it. Uh, but still doesn't mean cheap because we're still uh, talking approximately 40,000 US dollar. Okay, in a more common category of watches, if I can say so. Well, Panerai has introduced uh, six new uh, versions of their Luminor Due, 338, 242, and 145 millimeters, so kind of smaller models in general, thanks to a revised uh, mechanics, and three of them uh, come in a titanium case with blue dials and matching bracelets. Gégère Lecoult also went down the blue route with a new Polaris date, also with blue dial and uh, blue rubber bra bracelet. And this one is limited to 800 pieces. So the Polaris is kind of a new collection for the brand, actually it was reintroduced in 2018, with the goal of offering cheaper slash more reasonable alternative of its product range. But this is naturally very relative because it's not that cheap either. Okay, let's now talk about Oris, a brand we don't cover too much on the Watches TV, but I have to admit that I like this brand. A no-nonsense brand, good products, good design, and just good value for your money, in my opinion. In 2014, and for the 110th anniversary of the brand, Oris introduced their very own caliber, purposely called the 110. And its, uh, its first main particularity is that uh, this manual uh, wound uh, movement holds 10 days of power reserve. And the sec uh, second particularity is that uh, it displays this power reserve in an unconventional, non-linear way. So as you can see, the 10 days indicator increments are not of equal length. The closer you get to a lower power reserve, the bigger the size of these increments. And it just makes you more cautious on the fact that it needs to be wound again. So kind of a small detail, but I really like it and technically quite a feat. And this is what is celebrated uh, with this new Big Crown Pro Pilot X Caliber 115. So based on this initial movement, Oris introduced yearly variations, date version with 111, GMT version with 112, calendar version with 113, 24 uh, hour version with 114, and now uh, this 115 goes back in a certain way to the original version, meaning time only indication plus power reserve naturally. But it does so in a pretty cool and very modern looking open work version, coming in a titanium 44 millimeter case, integrated titanium lugs and bracelet, and you can now really enjoy their in-house movement from both sides with this uh, large case back sapphire glass. So one last thing I uh, wanted to add regarding different variation I just talked about is that these are not modules that have been added to the caliber. The, the way they architectured the, the, the movement enabled them to have an integrated approach to these various complications, meaning that they are part of the actual movement based on the space available. And that's quite smart of Oris. Nice move. Regarding the last product launch I want to mention in this prime time, I have uh, to say that I will do so with a little uh, smile on my face. We all know uh, how incredibly difficult it has become uh, to purchase a Patek Philippe Nautilus. And for the lucky owners out there, well, you must all be pretty happy since the value of most Nautiluses has just gone totally crazy. So when I saw the new BR05 collection of Bell & Ross, I have to admit that I simply couldn't think of anything else. And then the numbers made me think of something else. And then the screws about another thing and so on. Well, you get my point. Okay, so in a way, this is also a pretty smart, uh, but uh, maybe a bit opportunistic move. But that's business, uh, especially in today's context. Uh, but uh, it will be interesting to see how this watch will actually perform. 
and actually I'm quite looking forward to seeing it in real, only seen pictures so far. So that's it for the main uh, recent product launches and just wanted to mention that when you think about it, one has to acknowledge that it does uh, seem slightly easier for brands to come up with a reinterpretation of historical models than to come up with radical new things, so just food for thought. Okay, next subject and following one of the, the latest unboxing videos regarding the pretty spectacular Jacob & Co Astronomia Sky, well, a nice person from the audience uh, mentioned to us that he had actually deconstructed it in a way that you can now 3D print uh, part of this uh, crazy mechanism. So I've myself never tried any 3, uh, 3D printing, but I really like the idea of making these files available to all of us. And I'm seriously thinking of getting one uh, such machine and try to replicate this here at the Watchers Club. Uh, could be cool. And also wanted to mention that I'm pretty surprised and almost shocked actually by the number of views this uh, video reached. So I guess there are many people interested in these uh, mechanical sculptures. We might need to dig a little bit more, I see. Okay, now some business news. And despite the Swiss export uh, figures saying that all uh, was okay till the end of the first semester, I sincerely doubt that all is okay for many brands. There is for sure a slowdown but it affects mainly products under the 3000 US dollar mark as competition from connected watches and also by, uh, by non-Swiss made watches becomes stronger in this uh, lower price point category, especially 200, 500 I would say. And uh, with what has been uh, recently going on uh, in Hong Kong, well, this naturally won't help it uh, uh, as Hong Kong is the first export destination of Swiss watches. So a bit more uncertainty in the air. And the same can be said uh, with Brexit related questions, since we know that uh, during this spring and anticipating the effects of the Brexit, watches uh, sent from Switzerland to the UK uh, partly explained these good export figures I was referring to previously. So indeed, a few things uh, to worry about for some brands and the Swiss industry as a whole. And another example of this is when uh, Swatch Group was commenting their consolidated performance and was saying that all was uh, doing great for them. And at the same time, just by looking at their, the numbers, you could see that the volume of their watch inventory is practically as high as their turnover. So that's a lot of watches out there just waiting to be sold a lot. But some people don't have the same problem and I'm talking about the 10 or so power brands of the industry which are currently uh, reinforcing even more their power and dominance and naturally the best illustration of this is Rolex which is really in a totally different bowl game than all other brands combined. It's today almost impossible to find on a worldwide basis any steel Rolexes and it is said that they could multiply by four their production and still they wouldn't be able to satisfy this crazy demand. So the appeal for their watches is just insane and in fact it's quite a tricky situation for them to handle but a pretty comfortable one nevertheless. So they've increased production. Obviously, we don't have any official figures. That's not the style of the crown. But we believe that Rolex is now producing about 1.3 million watches per year. Well, one thing I can tell you uh, is that here in Geneva, well, we are very happy for them as they must be the biggest contributor to our state finances, whether directly through taxes or through their very generous and smart donation to cultural, educational, sportive and other projects. So viva the crown. But this shortage situation is being actually closely monitored by these brands. The, the one I was referring to before, because we know that uh, some speculators uh, are actively responsible for the situation. They are called the flippers, having access to some very desirable uh, pieces and offering flipping them with strong premiums on various selling platforms. And this is irritating some people at HQ, meaning that brands have started to look much more closely on who's doing what, where these watches uh, come from, and it might become a little bit more uncomfortable uh, or more difficult for some uh, to make this quick buck uh, reselling these watches. And I'm not talking uh, secondhand ones, but only brand new ones. So on one side, it's obviously very enjoyable to know that your products are so much desired. But when the situation totally gets out of hands from uh, these brands, well, that's not uh, what they want either. Okay, next news and uh, only a few days ago was revealed the final watches uh, that will compete in this year's GPHG, the Grand Prix d'Horlogerie de Genève, a competition uh, which is still redefining itself. So for the time being, more or less the same categories, 14 in total, more or less the same difficult to understand selection of watches per category, but that's six watch six watches per category. But sometimes you, you do feel that uh, the differences between them is just quite huge and uh, 
And well, anyhow, well, more or less the same jury voting for all this, but it's precisely this jury format which should normally evolve as of next year. Personally, I think this is a pretty indispensable uh, thing to do. And for an event which thinks of itself as the Oscars of the industry, well, they should uh, really go down the alley used by the Oscars and the Academy format, meaning that instead of a small group of uh, judges, you should have a much wider group of professionals involved and invited to vote. On top of it, all of them would become better advocates of the competition, I mean, giving it more exposure and credibility. Well, I've been thinking about this uh, for years and have been pretty vocal about it, but maybe now uh, we will finally see some uh, changes on the new president of the foundation uh, behind the event. He took over just uh, last year and these kind of changes uh, take time. Not on paper, but it's just so political. So again, I uh, really think the industry deserves such a competition, uh, but uh, we'll see what would happen. So for sure, I mean, for the time being, we are definitely more in a Cannes Festival type of competition and uh, going in an Oscar style format with a proper Academy approach really makes sense in my opinion. So for info, all the selected watchers will also start some kind of world tour starting in Sydney, Australia on the 28th and 29th of September, followed by Bangkok in early October, Mexico City in Puebla, before making it back to Geneva in early November and after the prize winning ceremony held here on the 7th of November, well, these watches will also be displayed during the Dubai Watch Week taking place at the end of that month. Anyhow, and if you want to know more, well, just go to the GPHG's uh, website uh, to view all selected watches and other info links uh, below. Okay, so what to expect this September, apart obviously from our fabulous Viva watchmaking party here at the Watchers Club. And it's really going to be so incredibly cool to meet some of you guys who will make it to Geneva. Well, apart from this uh, major event uh, with some very cool guests, uh, and as mentioned previously, all watches participating at the biannual Only Watch auction will be visible at the Monaco Yacht Show between the 25th and the 28th. And if you're in Montreal, Canada, on the 27th and 28th will uh, be held a special watch fair at the St. James Club with a few interesting brands and in uh, a bit in advance regarding October, just wanted to mention that in Poland will be held the Otto Kronos watch event between the 4th till the Sunday the 6th. And for the first time, I will attend this show being member of the jury. Ooh. And regarding October, well, plenty of good stuff happening around the planet. CR in Mexico City, Jubilux in Singapore will also attend and Watch Time New York. But we'll get back on this uh, in the following prime time. So this is it for this uh, uh, special yeah, edition of Prime Time. Hope you liked it. Thanks uh, for your great engagement on this uh, channel. Now officially silver play button channel. Uh, and well, might take a bit of time before reaching the next level. So all the very best to you. A massive Viva watchmaking to you. And a little final treat. But you know, when we receive this kind of thing, we receive a nice little letter from uh, YouTube that I mentioned before. But uh, I will read it out for you if you have any interest. And I understand if people walk out of this. Anyhow, so YouTube. You've just done something that very few YouTube creators accomplish. You had an astonishing 100,000 people subscribe to your channel. Thanks to you. Thank you. We know, the num that, we know that numbers on YouTube can't get really... Oh, I will start all over. You see, I'm getting emotional, I guess. Well, we know that numbers on YouTube can get really big, but we hope that you don't lose sight of the reality behind that six-digit milestone. Each and every person who has subscribed to your channel has been touched by what you created. They were inspired, challenged, or entertained. I hope it's true. You achieved this milestone with hard work, perseverance, that I can confirm, and probably a healthy sense of humor too. I hope so too. What, we've what you've accomplished can't be taken away from you and we'd like to recognize you and all your hard work with this Silver Creator Award, a small token of our esteem and respect. And a few advertising revenue for you. So we know that you don't do this for rewards. You do it because you have, to drive, you have a drive to create and share and because you found an audience who cares. And that's very, very true. Believe us when we say that we can't wait to see what you do next. A million subscribers may seem a long way off right now, but you're closer than you think and we're rooting for you. Congratulations. Yours sincerely, Susan Woshiski, CEO of YouTube. Well, that's a nice little treat. And I, I do admit that I do feel pretty proud. So, they were watchmaking, double one. See you soon.